Joining us to answer your questions during Breast Cancer Awareness Month is Dr. Cynthia Dragula, Assistant Professor of Surgery at the University of Maryland School of Medicine and Medical Director of the Aiello Breast Center at the University of Maryland, Baltimore, Washington Medical Center. Doctor, thank you so much for joining us during Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Tell us a, a couple of things that you want viewers to be most aware of. Sure, I think um, Breast Cancer Awareness Month um, is a great month for everybody to take a moment and take assessment, get caught up with uh, our health. Everybody has gotten a little bit behind since the pandemic, uh, getting back on track with regular uh, screenings, getting regular checkups from the days where uh, you know, we went every, maybe every year close to our birthday. Um, and so, so one of those things is mammography and getting back into getting annual mammograms, which you know should begin at 40. Uh, are, are you seeing- you know That early detection is helpful. Sorry to, to jump in there, but are you seeing the impact of that in in your surgical practice, people who maybe weren't able to get their annual mammogram? I've seen a number of women who got off track. Um, when you go every year for your mammogram, you know, there's a whole system for reminders um, so that, you know, you'll get a handy note little from your imaging facility that says, hey, it's time to schedule. Um, it's been almost a year since your, your prior exam. So I am seeing some women who came in, uh, who are coming in with breast cancer, who, who got off track. Um, some of those clues or cues that help them remember to schedule their appointment. Maybe their last mammogram was 2019. Um, many women are catching up, but, but it is, it is uh, time to do that. And you shouldn't be ashamed. None of us are going to say, oh, why haven't you been here yet? We all know. We all went through the pandemic. It's a perfect time to get caught up. You know, it, it of course has a reputation as, uh, let's say, an uncomfortable uh, procedure for women, and maybe that's part of the reason why why somebody wouldn't um, actively move it up on their calendar during the pandemic. Um, it, it it does, and, and I'm not going to discount the fact that there are some women who, on a good day, have sore breasts, and so then for them to go to get a mammogram, those women are going to find it's a little more uncomfortable. The majority of women, though, I think what they would describe it as a squeeze, describe it as a pressure. I mean, it's there. there's a lot of miserable things that women get to go through for the joys of being a woman. And on the scale of those, this, this isn't that bad. Um, you know, uncomfortable, maybe terrible for the majority of women, probably not. What are the official recommendations? I know they, you know, they get tweaked from time to time. What, what should women know about uh, who needs to get screened? Um, it's an excellent question because the guidelines do change, and if you change it, it does lead to some confusion. Um, we do recommend annual screening for women who are average risk, uh, starting at 40, um, including mammography. And in the state of Maryland, uh, you you can just go. You don't need a doctor's order for a screening mammogram in the state of Maryland if you're over the age of 40. Now, there are some women who are high risk. Either they have a strong family history, they know they carry a genetic mutation, um, perhaps they've had an abnormal biopsy in the past, and, and they do not follow the guidelines for average risk women. Um, their uh, screening protocol is tailored to their level of risk. We might recommend that they start getting their imaging earlier. Let me uh, remind our viewers if they have a question for the doctor about breast cancer uh, screening or treatment, give us a call at the number on the screen, or you can send an email to livequestions at mpt.org. When are the, the different kinds of, of screening technology, uh, MRIs, for example, 3D studies, when are those recommended? So I think the majority of mammograms that are going to be done now are going to be 3D. Um, we have found that you know the detection for smaller cancers, earlier cancers, um, sneakier cancers, um, there's no parallel there. The 3D imaging picks them up better. But technology has just improved in leaps and bounds anyway. I look at old mammograms from the 90s. I can't believe that we were ever happy with those. Um, the high-resolution images, can we can see so much more. 
Um, breast MRI is a different story because there's no strong recommendation for screening MRI for women who don't have certain mutations. We do use it frequently as a diagnostic tool when we want to get some more information. Um, many women find it confusing because there is a mandatory statement on the bottom of their mammogram report talking about their breast density. And indeed, um, MRI does see more clearly through a dense breast than a mammogram can. Does breast density um, impact somebody's risk of breast cancer, or, or is it just an impediment to uh, getting a, a clear mammogram? Um, it's both. So um, it does increase your risk slightly. Um, and the reason for that is, is not well understood. Is the dense breast tissue perhaps more biologically active? Or is it just simply it's so dense, maybe there are more breast cells uh, per gram and less fatty tissue, which does not contribute to breast cancer. Um, but it's not completely understood why breast density uh, increases the risk, but it does slightly. It certainly makes... Um, breast cancer are more difficult to detect. Let's talk about the treatment side. And uh, we'll start with uh, surgery because that's what you do. And there have been some uh, dramatic advances in surgical techniques. You know, a history of, of breast surgery goes back to Halstead in the 1800s. And if, if you look at it, every couple of decades, we've just had tremendous uh, changes in how we, we manage the disease. And each step of the way, it just gets better and better for women, from the radical mastectomy to the modified radical and, and the breast conserving options now, which the majority of women are candidates for keeping their breast, and just trying to design incisions and design reconstructive options um, to keep their cosmesis, you know, to, to help them look in the mirror and, and still feel good about themselves. Um, that's that's just every, every 10 years, there seems to be a major shift, and, and each time it gets better and better. Is that what's called a, a lumpectomy? And is there fear among your patients that if we're not taking the whole thing, we, we might be leaving something behind? Right. So it would be called a lumpectomy, or the medical term would be a wide local excision. Um, but we do know that, you know, sur for the last 40 years, we've known that survival rates between mastectomy and lumpectomy patients if, you know, for the same cancer is, is the same. Um, what surgery you choose um, when you're planning your breast surgery doesn't impact survival. Um, and, and so it really becomes a question of the mechanics of the operation and how big is the tumor relative to the breast side size. You know, can, is it something you can really get out and still leave a presentable breast? Or in some cases, a woman might have multiple tumors and she might, they might be widespread apart. She may have three or four tumors simultaneously in the same breast. And in, in that case, maybe mastectomy is a safer option for them. What typically happens following surgery? Um, radiation, uh, medical treatment, both? What, what do you generally both. recommend? So, so breast cancer is a multidisciplinary uh, treatment plan. Um, and our practice, we have a, a can we're a cancer center and we have a team and we sit together every week on a Wednesday morning. And I like to joke that we talk about the patients behind their back, but I'm there for surgery. We have radiation oncologists, we have medical oncologists, we look at the mammograms, we look at the pathology. Um, our, our social worker is there, we have our genetic counselor there, and we bring the team together to create a cancer plan for each individual patient. And some will need, you know, most need surgery, some will need um, medication. It's not always chemo. It it might be hormonal therapy. Um, many patients need radiation therapy, but that way every specialty gets to weigh in at the very beginning to come up with the best option for the patient. What, um, you know, personally, uh, your, your uh, journey from medical school through uh, into, into practice, I believe you were trained as a general surgeon. So what, what led you into this specialty? 
Yeah. So believe it or not, when I went to medical school, my plan was to work in a lab. <laughs> I'd spent my summers working at the NIH and I just thought that was all I wanted to do. But, you know, I did my surgical rotation and, and that was it. I was sold. Um, and I'd been in the fire department as a much younger person. And so I gravitated more towards, you know, emergency surgeries. But, you know, over, over the years, I did more and more breast surgery too. And um, I thought it was important work to do. I mean, certainly there there is a need um, uh, for good breast care. Uh, one in eight women get breast cancer. So there's also a lot of work to do. And you know, women are busy. They, they take care of everybody else first. And um, when they get this kind of diagnosis, they need someone who's going to be there to take care of them, to not hassle them, to understand them and, and get them through it. I know you, you encourage patients to have a a positive uh, attitude. Talk about the, the the power of positivity, but but also the the increasing uh, list of good reasons to be positive about being able to treat this condition. Sure. Well, I think that the first reaction a patient feel, feels is is fear. You know, you hear the cancer word, and and it's scary. And there are some women, you know, who come out at, at immediately out of the gates and they're ready and they blow us all away with a positive attitude. Um, they're ready to fight. Um, some women are, are, are really frightened and, and, and they need help getting there. Um, so it's important to have a team, including social workers and, you know, and support groups to help them with that positivity because, you know, you're having a strong spirit, having, having you know, an optimistic outlook is going to help you help you get through it because because this stuff is hard. Um, as far as though a reason to hope, you know, survival rates are better than they were 30 years ago. And 30 years ago, we thought we were pretty modern and we were doing pretty well. And and to think what has improved as far as medications, targeted therapies immunotherapies, better surgeries, better radiation, um, it's really starting to manifest in improved survival rates. So so women are, are not only, you know, doing better, they're getting through it more easily, they're living. And and we want them to do that. We, we have a survivorship program to make sure that we keep them on track, that we prep for success, um, because they really do have a good reason to hope. I tell my patients, I never sugarcoat ever. If I tell you I think you're going to be fine, it's because I really do believe it. And, and I end up saying that an awful lot now. That's great. You know, one of the things we, we hear less about than, than maybe 30 years ago is uh, breast self exams for women and maybe men. I mean, men occasionally uh, get this. Have the recommendations on that changed? They have, and it's counterintuitive. I mean, might, one might think if you stayed on a schedule and checked every month that, you know, that it would improve survival rates. And, you know, there were several good trials looking at it, and, and for some reason, it just doesn't seem to, to be the case. And, you know, the women also, you know, they felt a lot of guilt. It was hard to do. You know, if, you know, your doctor asked you, are you doing your self-exams? And you kind of have to be sheepish and say, well, maybe I missed a few. You know, it, it, it didn't seem to help so much. What we ask women to do is just to, to be aware of what's normal for them. Because breast tissue can be lumpy. There's lots of different textures. It's like, you know, it's like hair and all the different varieties that we have. And so if a woman is aware of what's normal for her, she might be more alerted to something that's being is a new change, and, and that's the type of stuff we want to bring to our attention. Dr. Cynthia Dragula joining us from the University of Maryland, Baltimore, Washington Medical Center and the Aiello Breast Center. Doctor, we appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks. Your health segments are a co-production of Maryland Public Television and the University of Maryland Medical System.